Since time immemorial, India has been a source of wonder to the entire world. This ever-flowing Ganga has nourished a civilization which has always excelled in unveiling the secrets of creation. The beauty of the thoughts produced by this marvelous civilization is unparalleled. Its amazing mysticism and philosophy has bewildered the entire world. This culture has been a perfect showcase of the underlying unity of a great diversity of views, paths, ideologies and opinions. Ekam Satyam Vipra Bahuddha Vadanti Proclaim the Vedic Scriptures Truth is one. Noah's express it in different ways. No wonder India is associated with mystique, the land of a thousand mysteries. Since times unknown, explorers have sought knowledge, wisdom and insight into the various riddles and facets of this grand civilization. The pursuit is still on. India continues to fascinate, to intrigue. India's Himalayan Valley of Kashmir has been known as the heaven on earth. These waters of the Dal Lake have seen innumerable chapters of history unfolding one after another. Even now, there are many secrets of the past which beckon the spirit of exploration. Some of them have the potential to completely alter our perception of history. One such intriguing history is lying quietly since more than 1,900 years in this Kanyar locality of Srinagar. This place conceals one of the biggest mysteries of the modern world. The Rosable Shrine, burial place of Yuza Asaf. This board displays an information about the book Tariq e Azam, written in 1729 AD by Kwaza Azam Dedmari. This spot is famous as the resting place of a messenger. I have read in an ancient book that a prince from a foreign land arrived here and engaged himself in piety and prayers and became messenger of God for the Kashmiri people. What is intriguing is that since always this user Asaf is considered to be none other than Jesus Christ himself, the savior of mankind. A number of Sanskrit, Buddhist, Persian, Arabic and Kashmiri historical texts show that Yuza Asif is another name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not the original name of the Savior. His original Hebrew name was perhaps Yeshua. His name in other languages are derivatives of this Hebrew name. According to these texts, Jesus did not die on the cross. He survived the crucifixion and migrated to live in Kashmir. In Kashmir, he preached for a long time and finally left his physical frame at a very old age. 
and this is supposed to be his tomb. The shrine is beautifully decorated and lighted. The carvings of Kashmiri designs add to the grandeur of the place. The air is filled with fragrance of the divine. The tomb itself is of a pre-Islamic period. This old photograph shows that the wooden coffin was actually covered with a cloth of Jewish appearance. This huge wooden sarcophagus, which we see is only a facade. The real tomb is in the underground chamber, which is sealed now. The tomb lies in east-west direction, which is distinctly the Jewish direction of burial. It cannot be a Muslim tomb, because Muslims bury their dead in southwest direction. We all know that Jesus Christ was a born Jew. In the 18th century, the Grand Mufti of Kashmir was the highest court of law in this land. In 1766 AD, he issued a decree regarding the Rosable Shrine. According to this decree, Yusa Asad was a prophet to the people of Kashmir. And he had come to Kashmir during the reign of King Gopananda. It is well known that King Gopananda ruled Kashmir during the first century AD. This matches exactly with the time period of Jesus Christ. There is another very tantalizing evidence. These are the footprints of Yusa Asaf. They show deep marks of wounds something like those of crucifixion. Well-known scientist Kurt Berner an has examined these marks and says that this is exactly how the feet of Jesus were nailed on the cross, one upon the other, pierced with a single nail. There's no doubt in my mind that Jesus and Yusasa are exactly the same person. I think the evidence is overwhelming. There are several websites which provide detailed information on this subject. They contain a wide range of information on every aspect of the life of Christ in India. There have been several national and international researchers who strongly share this belief. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, the founder of the Ahmadiyya sect of Islam, published his Urdu book, Masih Hindustan Me, or Christ in India, in the late 19th century. He did a detailed research on Rosable Shrine and studied the local traditions of the people of Kashmir. He collected signatures of a large number of local inhabitants of Kanyar in support of his theory. Aziz Kashmiri's book, Christ in Kashmir, is one of the most authoritative works on the subject. Andreas Faber Kaiser wrote, Jesus died in Kashmir. Jesus, Moses, and ten lost tribes of Israel. Holger Kirsten's book, Jesus Lived in India, created quite a stir in the West. Edward Martin is the author of King of Travelers, Jesus' Lost Years in India. Some of the most comprehensive books are written by Fida Hasnain and Suzanne Olson, Rosable, The Tomb of Jesus, and The Rosable, Beyond the Da Vinci Code. It is really hard to believe that Jesus Christ had any connection with India. Leave alone the story of his life and death in Kashmir. The mainstream Christianity scoffs at any such idea. Christianity is based on the faith that Jesus died on the cross, was resurrected and then ascended to the heaven to sit next to God. 
every faith has its own reasons. The Roman Church was established on this very faith. And this very faith has made Christianity the largest religion in the world. We all adore, love and hold Jesus Christ dear in our hearts as one of the saviors of mankind. Still, the human mind is always curious. It always seeks to unravel the secrets of history. One such seeker lives here in this quaint bungalow in Srinagar. Destiny has bestowed this seeker with opportunities and facilities to seek what lies beyond the obvious. Dr. Fida Hasnain is now the single most credentialed person who has an intimate interest and thorough knowledge of the theory that connects Jesus to India. He is the former director of archives, archaeology, research and museum for Kashmir and was once listed in Who's Who in Archaeology. Dr. Hasnain is MA, LLB, PhD and D.Lit and has been honored with a number of awards for his excellence in several streams of knowledge. It was indeed destiny that put him on the trail of doing research on the history of Jesus in India. It was by chance that I got interested in the subject. I happened to be the director of archives, archaeology and research and museum in the state and I would go to Ladakh often. We got stuck up there and we had no work so we were in search of books. So I went to the Marian Mission Library to search out some books so that we could read. And I became friendly with the caretaker of that Marian Mission. His name was Reverend Chatan Punsuk. He told me that he has a very interesting reference about Saint Isa. I said, what do you mean by Saint Isa? And he told me about Isa, what you say, Hazrat Isa, one of the prophets. The name of Nicholas Nauti was, was there and it came to light that he had come to Ladakh. He had stayed at this uh, Hamas Gumpa and he obtained the life of Jesus Christ. In the late 19th century, Nicholas Notovic's book, The Unknown Life of Jesus Christ, had created quite a sensation. It contained texts from ancient Buddhist manuscripts describing the life of Jesus in India. In 1887, Nicholas Notovic was traveling on horseback in the Ladakh region. During the journey, he happened to visit an ancient Buddhist monastery near Leh. In these beautiful surroundings is situated the magnificent monastery of Hemis. These monasteries have stood tall since hundreds of years, braving the vagaries of time. These are the repositories of the teachings of the great Buddha whose message of love and peace had reached the remote corners of the world hundreds of years before Christ. Away from the glamour and pollution of modernity, these monasteries maintain their possessions and way of life intact. Generations keep changing, but the acquisitions remain unchanged and uncorrupted. Nicholas Notovich stayed in this monastery for some days. During his stay, he befriended a Lama. The Lama shared some astonishing things with him. He showed him ancient scrolls which mentioned the story of Jesus in India. There are hundreds and thousands of ancient manuscripts in these archives. They contain discourses of the teachings of Buddha and great Buddhist monks of yore. 
Many of these manuscripts have come from other Tibetan monasteries and ancient universities like Nalanda of Magadha. Ancient India had several great universities, learning centers and libraries like Nalanda, Vikramshila, Takshashila and Udantpuri. When the Mughals invaded India, they destroyed most of these universities. When the attacks were taking place, many Buddhist monks escaped to Tibet carrying loads of manuscripts and books with them. The Hemis manuscript which Notovich saw was perhaps one of such documents, which reached the Patola Palace in Lhasa. The original Pali version is still supposed to be there. What is in Hemis is a Tibetan translation of the original Pali text. These documents have been seen not only by Notovich but by many others. A disciple of Ramakrishna Paramhans, Swami Abedananda, went to cross-check Notovich's discovery and published the text in his own book, Journey into Kashmir and Tibet. Many other explorers have also seen these documents. These scrolls also reveal the story of Jesus Christ between the age of 13 and 28 years. It is surprising that the Holy Bible contains no story of Jesus during this period. The scripture is completely silent about these years of Christ, but the scrolls of Hemis reveal all. The advent of Jesus Christ took place in the city of Bethlehem, in the state of Palestine, which is now Israel. Right from the time of his birth, this son of Maryam and Joseph became the synergia of the eyes of the wise and learned. When he grew up, he bewildered the elders with his explanations and interpretations of the scriptures. This extraordinary talented boy attracted and impressed one and all. People from all over flocked to hear him. The Hemis manuscripts tell us that around the age of 13, boy Jesus left his home and traveled to the east. He traveled through the famous Silk Route, which links Europe and Asia. Then he arrived in India. After crossing Punjab, Jesus reached Rajputana, the majestic land of Rajasthan. He spent some time with the Jains, the followers of Vardhaman Mahavira. Then he proceeded toward the east coast of India and reached the city of Jagannath Puri in Orissa. This town houses the ancient temple of Lord Jagannath. Lord Krishna is known as Jagannath here. Puri has been an ancient seat of Vedic culture and studies. This magnificent temple has been in existence hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. Even today, millions of devotees throng the temple, which is highly revered in the entire region. The Hemis manuscript discovered by Nicholas Notovich refers to Jesus as Isa. The scrolls reveal that young Isa studied Vedas in this city of Puri. He also learned to cure by aid and prayers and mastered many other spiritual techniques. Not only did Isa master the Vedic scriptures, he also started preaching their real meaning to the masses. Initially, the priests of Puri welcomed him, but later they grew jealous and started creating troubles. Isa was compelled to leave Jagannath Puri. He then moved to Rajgriha, the ancient capital of Magadha. Lord Buddha had lived and preached here for a very long time. In those times, India's Magadha Empire 
was the most advanced and happening place in the world. Magadh had some of the best schools of learning. Young Isa is supposed to have attended some esoteric school in this kingdom. He started becoming familiar with the teachings of Lord Buddha. After Rajgriha, Jesus lived in the holy city of Varanasi for a few years. On the banks of Ganga, this city was known as Kashi during those times. Here, Isa studied holy scriptures and other sciences under a guru whose name is said to be Udraka. After some time, he left the city. According to Hemis manuscripts, Jesus came to Ladakh after traveling through Nepal, Tibet and other parts of the Himalayas. He was a great traveler. In fact, some scholars refer to him as the king of travelers. He spent some time in the Buddhist monasteries of the Himalayas and then returned to his homeland. Jesus Christ as a young man came to uh, India and he visited various places. He went to Kathmandu. He got influenced with Vedanta and philosophy as, uh, as, well, as, as well as with Buddhism. And uh, naturally, he learned from Buddhism non-violence, brotherhood, peace, certain principles of coexistence. And naturally, when he started in min his ministry in Palestine, he taught the same principles which are enshrined in Buddhist canon. Right thinking, right thought, right action, non-violence, compassion, brotherhood, peace. There is nothing written in the Bible about the activities of Jesus between the age of 13 to 28. He suddenly appears in Judea at the age of 29. He started preaching and establishing his ministry from there onwards. After a few years, the great Messiah, the Son of God, was crucified in his own country. Most of us associate crucifixion with death. But many biblical experts feel that Jesus had not died on the cross. There are some strong reasons to believe that. Jesus was nailed only on the hands and the feet. These are not life-threatening injuries. His vital organs were unharmed. It takes quite a long time to die on the cross. But Jesus was taken down within a few hours. When his body was scratched, blood and water came out. This can happen only if the person is alive. Many experts feel that the ointments which were used to treat him are for recuperation. They are not used for funerals. All these factors indicate that there was a plot to save Jesus Christ and he was indeed saved. The Bible says that Christ rose from the dead after three days. Or was he simply healed in three days? I think that the events of the crucifixion was not, it didn't culminate in a resurrection, it culminated in a resuscitation, like a near-death experience, that he survived. The life that he lived after the crucifixion was absolutely phenomenal. He got a lot of things done. Um, he wasn't in hiding. He wasn't a, a miserable barefoot prophet. He was a great leader. He led several exoduses out of Israel. The Bible reports Jesus Christ as walking and talking after his supposed death on the cross. There are at least 12 physical appearances of Jesus after crucifixion. First, he appeared to Mary Magdalene and assured her that he was alive. We know about the Last Supper. Jesus had food with his disciples. He wanted to convince them that he was not a ghost. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, because a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see me have them. Luke chapter 24 verse 39. When Thomas doubted, 
Jesus asked Thomas to check for himself whether he was alive or not. The twelfth appearance of Christ was in Damascus, full six years after crucifixion. These physical appearances are very strong signs that Jesus Christ had not died on the cross. When he was saved from the cross, his uh, concert, Mary Magdalene, flew towards France and he fled away towards Iran, Damascus, and then Tehran and Iran on the same Silk Route. There was in those days the great national highway between Asia and Europe. And the same, he traveled again to, on the same route towards this side. He was accompanied by his mother Mary and a group of followers. There are two major Persian books of history. Iqmal Udin of 10th century AD and Razat us Safa of the 15th century. They record that Jesus took the name of Yuza Asaf in Persia and the Turkey region. A Persian dictionary called Farangi Asafia says that Hazrat Isa was known as Yuzu and as he cured lepers, he became known as Yuza Asaf. The healer of lepers. So Yuzu Asaf. Healer. So they gave him his name and then from that, uh, from Iran uh, to Kashmir, he is remembered by the same name. When he reached Gandhar, Mother Mary passed away. A tomb can be seen even today. The place of her death is now known as Muri and falls in Pakistan. The Acts of Thomas mentions the arrival of Jesus in the famous city of Takshila. These are the ruins of the famous university which was at Takshila. It was a great center of learning and Buddhist studies. King Gondophorus was the ruler when Jesus had visited Takshila. From Takshila, Jesus reached Kashmir. Zara zara hai mere Kashmir ka mehma namaz. Raha mein patar ke tukru ne diya paani mujhe. Even the, even the stones give water to pilgrims here. He said, it is a, Kashmir is a land of, they say, um, they say rich world. Land of rishis. The entire Kashmir is indeed a blessing of the divine. There is something in Kashmir which uplifts the soul. After all, there has to be some reason why Jesus Christ chose Kashmir to settle down. One of the reasons of Christ's arrival in Kashmir can be traced here. This is Gutli Bhag, about 50 kilometers from Srinagar. People are simple, hard-working and efficient in whatever they do. What makes them different is that they are not original Kashmiris. Centuries ago, they came here from Afghanistan's side. They speak the Pashto language, but they have not forgotten that they are originally Jews from Palestine, the homeland of Jesus Christ. They call themselves Bani Israel. History tells us that out of 12 Jewish tribes, 10 had migrated away from Israel since five centuries before Christ. These scattered 10 tribes have been known as the lost sheep of Israel. Many of these lost Jewish tribes have got settled along the Silk Route, Afghanistan, and up to Kashmir. There are huge Jewish populations uh, along the Silk Route. Afghanistan, most of the tribes in Afghanistan, the warlords, the Taliban, uh, the, um, the Pashtuns, 
are all descended from the 12 tribes of Israel and many are still known by their their tribal names, their biblical names. And they wandered um, and settled uh, across most of Afghanistan and what is now Pakistan, northern India and Kashmir. Gathering these lost sheep back in his fold was one of the missions of Christ's life. In the Bible, Jesus says, Go not into the way of Gentiles, and into the city of Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Scholars suggest that the lost sheep of the house of Israel Jesus was referring to included these Jewish tribes which were settled in the regions adjoining Kashmir. These tribes are of a tall, robust frame of body with manly features. The women, fully formed and beautiful, with aquiline noses, and their features also resemble the Jews. Most of the Afghan tribes are the descendants of the Jews. He wanted to seek and save them. Therefore, it is no wonder that he proceeded towards Kashmir. This is the residence of Qutb Alam Badshah, the head Maulavi of Gutlibag. Today, there is a big gathering to sing glory of the Lord. Qutb Alam Badshah presides over the function. The culture and tradition of Kashmiris are different from ours. We have not forsaken our traditions. Their eating habits, costumes and living style is very different from ours. So far, we have not had marital relations with them. Their culture is different. Ours is different. With the advent of modernity, this community is showing signs of change. They are opening up to new ideas. As India is developing fast in a globalized world today, the Kashmiris are also reaping rich dividends. There are several such communities of Bani Israel in Kashmir and India. These people of Jewish descendants have physical features which are strikingly different from other Indian communities. Some genetic studies are also being conducted which indicate the Jewish links. Experts have identified more than 90 tribal or caste names which are common both to Kashmir and Israel. There are a large number of terminologies in Kashmir which might be having Hebrew links. Mr. M.B. Alam lives in his residence at Gutlibag. He is a scholar of the history of Bani Israel. We are Israelis, connected to Prophet Moses. Prophet Ibrahim had 11 children. Huda was the eldest. We are his descendants. We are Bani Israel. Our living style, food habits, traditions and even language is different from that of Kashmiris. When Jesus came to Kashmir, Buddhism held complete sway in the region. Together with Buddhism was existing the Vedic culture. So, it is but natural that most ancient records of the arrival of Jesus is found in Pali and Sanskrit documents. The greatest evidence we have from Vishema Puran. Then we have the Chinese, Chinese documents, glass mirror. We have Tibetan, we have Persian manuscripts also. We have manuscripts in Arabic and information in all the things. But the main information, the chief information is from the Sanskrit work Bhavishya Mahapurana. Bhavishya Mahapurana 
is an ancient Sanskrit treatise and one of 18 major Puranas. According to some experts like Dr. Fida Hasnain, it was written in the 2nd century AD. This Mahapurana mentions a meeting of Isa Masih with King Shalivahan. Jesus is called Isa Masih in Sanskrit texts. Shalivahan was one of the major kings in Kashmir during the 1st century AD. He had established the rule of the Aryans on this side of the river Sindhu or Indus. The Purana says, One day, King Shalivahan went to the Himalayas. There, in the land of Ladakh, he saw a pious man in the mountains. His skin was fair and he wore white garments. The king asked the holy man who he was. The holy man replied, I am the son of God and am born of an unmarried woman. I have been sent as a prophet to the fallen ones. After the purification of the essence and the impure body and after seeking refuge in the Vedas, man will pray to the eternal. The holy man further said that he has been called Isa Masih. This is a very interesting document indeed. It clearly mentions the name of Isa Masih. It also speaks of him as the son of God and born from an unmarried woman. Glass mirror is another ancient document mentioning the details of Jesus Christ as Yuza Asaf. The glass mirror is the history of religions written in Chinese which was translated into Tibetan. The glass mirror puts Yuza Asaf on the same pedestal as that of Buddha. His teachings were similar to that of Buddha. It says, however, that the teachings and fame of Yuza Asaf did not spread much out of Kashmir. In Kashmir, we have mysticism. We have Silsile Rashiya, that means Rashi order. Its base is Buddhist, Shaivist, and then Islamic. It is composite. Our great Rashi Laldet says, Mazan Hindu Musliman. Don't think in terms of Hindus and Muslims. Shiv Chi Thali Thali Vuchan. Shiva is looking upon you minutely. Turukhe chuk yohezan. If you are intelligent, you must understand this point. This point. That all human beings are same. It is believed that when Jesus arrived in Kashmir, he first stayed near Pahalgaon. In these serene surroundings is located the famous shrine of Ash Mukam. This monument is known as the burial place and shrine of Baba Sheikh Zainuddin Rishi. He was one of the main saints of Kashmir's famous Rishi order. This entire mosque is constructed over a cave in the mountain. The cave has been used by sages, monks and saints since Vedic times. Kashmir's Rishi order starts from the Vedic sages. It was taken forward by the Buddhist monks and continued by the Muslim saints. It is an unique example of composite culture which is the hallmark of Kashmir. Isa or Jesus is supposed to have lived in this cave when he first came to Kashmir. Ancient Rishinamas or the chronicles of the sages indicate towards this fact. The original name of Sheikh Zainuddin Rishi was Jai Singh. He had come here in the mid 15th century. People from all walks of life come here. 
to seek solace. They have immense faith in the shrine. This place was earlier known as Ashosh Mukam, which almost means the abode of Isa. In course of time, it got corrupted to Ash Mukam. So Ash Mukam is basically a place where Jesus has lived, he has meditated, and his that that rod is there. Ash Mukam preserves Asai Isa or the rod of Jesus. It is the rod which Isa used to carry with him all the time. The rod is not shown to anybody now. Mullah Naiduri compiled his history of Kashmir in 1420 AD. He writes that Yusa Asif came to Kashmir during the reign of King Gopananda in the 1st century AD. Mullah Naiduri has mentioned that Hazrat Isa or Jesus Christ had adopted the name of Yusa Asif. He mentions Jesus as Hazrat Isa Ru Allah, meaning thereby Isa, the Spirit of God. Some archaeological evidences also support the arrival of Jesus in Kashmir. This ancient Shiva temple was built in 220 BC. According to historian Mullah Naiduri, King Gopananda got this temple repaired in the first century. For repairing the temple, Gopananda sought the advice and guidance of Yusa Asa. This fact is supported by other historical documents too. There are four pillars around this temple. There were ancient inscriptions on each of these pillars. Now they have been completely erased. But two inscriptions were photographed in 1869 by Henry Hardy Cole, the then Superintendent of Archaeological Survey of India. During this period, Yusa Asif proclaimed his prophethood, year 54. He is Yusu, the prophet of the children of Israel. The mason of this pillar, Razi Hashti Zaku, year 54. This pillar in honor of Eli Kim, son of Marjan. The inscriptions mention Kashmiri year 54. This corresponds to 78 AD. Thus, the probable year of the arrival of Yusa Asif or Jesus Christ in Kashmir is 78 AD. There is also a possibility of an interesting link between the Jewish culture and Shaivism. This is the Star of David, the most sacred symbol of the Jews. In Vedic culture, this is the symbol of Shiva and Shakti, the conjunction of masculine and feminine forces which gives rise to creation. The Shiva Lingam in Yonipit is a 3D representation of the same symbol. The Shiva temple of the Gopadri hill also houses a Shiva Lingam. The Shiva angle becomes prominent when we find that there is a mention of Isa in the ancient scrolls of the Nath sect of India. It is an extremely old, secretive and mystic sect of Shiva worshippers. Their ancient book Nath Namavali Sutra mentions Isa as Isa Nath. It says that Isanath finally got settled in Kashmir. The fourth inscription on the Shiva temple is very intriguing. This pillar in honor of Eli Kim, son of Marjan. But who was Marjan? Story is that Yusasa married Marjan, a shepherdess from the village of shepherds. Now in Kashmiri we say Pohol Gam. Gam means village, Pohol means shepherd. 
traversed by boulder strewn Lida River, Pahalgaon is a major center of tourist attraction in Kashmir. Shepherds come from far off lands bringing along their flocks of sheep. People are traditional and rooted very strongly to their culture. According to the Persian history book, Nigaristane Kashmir, Yuza Asif married a shepherdess Salgaon. It was King Shalivahan who persuaded Yuza Asif or Isa Masi to marry. The king had shortlisted some girls from whom Isa selected Marja of Pahalgaon to be his wife. According to inscriptions on the Shiva temple, Eli Kim was the name of the son of Marjan and Isa. It seems that there are many aspects of history on which proper research has still not been done. Archaeological investigations lead us to another place called Harwan near Srinagar. Adjacent to Harwan is the ancient archaeological site where the fourth great Buddhist council was held in the first century AD. These walls of small boulders and pebbles have preserved history which unfolded more than 1,900 years ago. It is a saga of that time when great Kanishka was the king of this part of the world. In the first century AD, he convened a great council of Buddhist monks at this very place. Scholars came down from far off places like Central Asia, China, Sri Lanka and other parts of India. This fourth Buddhist council is a landmark event in the history of Buddhism. It gave birth to Mahayana Buddhism. Who was the moving force behind the great revival of Buddhism? Such a great insight requires a great personality. Scholars feel that this great personality was none other than Yuza Asif. The strongest evidence for this are the two coins released by Kanishka. One coin mentions Buddha or Buddha. The second coin mentions Yuzo or Yuza Asif. It is clear that Kanishka respected and adored Yuza Asif in the same light as Buddha. It is indeed highly fascinating to see one personality of Yuza Asif uniting Christianity, Buddhism, Vedic culture and Islam together. The truth is one. The prophet, sages and saints reveal the same truth in different ways. They are the confluence points of diversity of views. Love to all is their fundamental message. We, the ignorant followers, create conflicts and sects. But the messengers of God preach oneness of truth. The evidences are very strong that Yuza Asif, the prophet buried at Rozabal, and Jesus Christ are the same person. The next step of research should be DNA testing of the tomb. We must use the latest scientific techniques to ascertain the final truth. The DNA is the next important tool that we need uh, to help establish the truth about Rosa Ball tomb. Whatever may be the ultimate truth, the Rosa Ball Shrine stands as a great heritage, not only of India, but of entire mankind. It must be preserved properly and should be open to all. This shrine, which is revered by Christians, by Hindus, by Muslims, by Jews, it is a national heritage and it, it should be taken over by UNESCO. It should be taken over by government of India. It should be looked after by the archaeological survey of India. I think it is the responsibility of India and the government of Kashmir to step up to the plate, to, um, to take Rosa Ball, to protect it and restore it,
and to preserve it for all future generations. In the city of Patna, there is the Khuda Baksh Oriental Public Library. It houses a large number of ancient books and documents. There is a book in Urdu in the library by the name of Kissa Shehzada Yusa Asif Wo Hakim Balahar, a story of Prince Yusa Asif and Hakim Balahar. It describes the moment of death of Yusa Asif in Kashmir. Yusa Asif called one of his disciples Ya Bhod and instructed him to build a tomb at the very place of his death. Then the great saviour delivered his last sermon. Now, at this last moment, my spirit is ready to fly towards the Holy One. It is necessary for all of you to follow the commandments of God. None should go towards the untruth, leaving the truth. This is indeed a message for the entire humanity. This Roosevelt Shrine is perhaps the most unique place in the world. Nowhere else do we find such a great confluence of religions, thoughts and beliefs. It conveys to us the message of the Savior who was the Prince of Peace. Generations will come and generations will go. The grand cosmic play of God and His messengers never sanctions conflicts and hatred. The only will of the Supreme Father is love. This is the message of the Rosabal Shrine, the supposed tomb of Jesus in India. Mm -hmm.